Code Talker by Joseph Bruchek. Chapter 23. Bababu. Happy New Year, Jarhead, Smitty said before he poured part of his bottle of beer over my head. I had to laugh. He and several of our other Signal Corps guys had just put on grass skirts and were swaying their hips to imitate the hula dancers we'd been entertained by on Hawaii, which was now thousands of miles away from us, poor lonely Marines. My shoulder was still too stiff for me to lift my arm high enough to return the favor to Smitty, so I covered the mouth of my own bottle of beer with my thumb and shook it. Happy 1945, I yelled as I squirted it foam back at him. 1945. I could hardly believe it. On the one hand, it seemed to me as if it were a few days ago when I was standing in the recruiting office, convincing the Marines that I was old enough to join up. But on the other hand, Remembering the battles I'd been through and the many men I'd seen killed or wounded, it seemed as if those days when I was just a Navajo boy going to school and helping his family with the sheep were long, long ago. I wished so much that this war would be over and I could go back to being just a Navajo sheep herder again. Along with a lot of other Marines, including a bunch of us code talkers, I was now on a tiny Pacific island called... Pavavu. It was as hot as Bougainville and the bugs were even worse. Not only did a lot of Marines get malaria, there was also this disease carried by insects that made your arms and legs swell up. All we could do was spray DDT everywhere. Yes, grandchildren, I know that DDT is a very bad poison, but back then it was all we had to use. We used so much of it that there was a joke I started making. Hey! I'd say to the cooks in the, in the mess hall. My food didn't taste so good today. Next time we'll put more DDT in it. The DDT didn't stop the rats. They were everywhere on Pavavu. Big black and brown rats. After dark, the ground rippled with them. If you set foot outside your door at night, there was a good chance you would step on one of them. My old friends, the giant land crabs, were there too. Just as many of them as there were rats. They were on the ground, climbing up the coconut trees, scratching on the sides of our tents. They never seemed to bother each other, those rats and land crabs. But they sure as shoot and bothered me. As soon as it started to get dark on Pavavu, I went inside and stayed there. But during the days we were kept pretty busy on Pavavu. How about Bayato? That means underwater. Chaw, that's frog. That would be good for amphibious. As always, we code talkers had to add to our vocabulary. Some of the new terms we were creating had to do with secret underwater demolition teams. Men trained to swim beneath the surface of the water with air tanks on their backs and rubber flippers on their feet. They looked so much like underwater monsters that it made me uncomfortable to look at them in their gear. Frogmen. Those frogmen went quietly at night in small rubber boats into the enemy territory. They did such dangerous things as laying charges on the hulls of enemy ships or placing explosives to clear paths through reefs. We code talkers knew better than anyone that what those brave frogmen did, not just because we had to send messages about them. Whenever frogmen teams went in ahead of an invasion, one or two Navajos with radios were with them in their rubber boats but you can bet that none of us code talkers ever went underwater with them. Because our code was used for top secret messages, I knew about a lot of things. I even had heard, heard mention of new giant bombs being prepared, but I told no one. Our code was only one of many secrets I kept. That was just the way it had to be during wartime. In fact, every serviceman in the Pacific knew secrets that had to be kept from his civilian friends and relatives back in the States. That is why every GI letter home was read by censors who often blacked out big sections. The suicide planes the Japanese were now sending against us were among those secrets kept from those at home. Japanese pilots were no longer just dropping bombs and strafing. Now they were coming in waves of small planes called kamikazes. Loaded with high explosives, their aim was to dive right into the target especially big targets like our battleships and aircraft carriers. Before February of 1945, the ordinary American people didn't know about kamikazes. 
Our commanders wanted to maintain morale back home and did not want to frighten the civilians. It was like not showing pictures of dead American soldiers. For the whole first year America was in the war, there were no photographs of dead American soldiers in any American newspaper, not even until 1943. It troubled me deeply to think of enemies so determined to kill us that we would give up their own lives. That they would give up their own lives. Whenever a Japanese pilot volunteered to become a kamikaze pilot, he was given a funeral service before he got into his plane. The Japanese government made it sound as if these men would be great heroes. Their deeds would save Japan. As I've said before, I have always loved reading history. All through the war, I did research in ship libraries and borrowed books from Marine officers who were history buffs and who liked the idea of an Indian being a historian. I kept on doing that kind of research after the war, too. So over the years, I was able to learn where the idea of the kamikazes came from. Here is the story. 700 years ago, Kublai Khan was a ruler of China. He decided that he and his Mongols should invade Japan. He put together a huge fleet and sent it off to Japan. But before it got there, a great typhoon roared out of the Pacific and sank every ship. Seven years later, Kublai Khan sent a second huge fleet. Just like the first, it was destroyed by the giant wind that the Japanese began to call Kamikaze. Kamikaze, the holy wind. They believed that holy wind would always defend Japan. The pilots who flew the suicide mission thought they were flying with that holy wind. A Japanese rear admiral, Masafumi Arima, was the first kamikaze pilot. In October of 1944, he tried to crash his plane into the aircraft carrier Franklin. A Navy fighter shot him down into the sea before he was even close. However, the Japanese propaganda machine made him into a martyr. They said that he sank a giant American ship. Thousands of people volunteered to be kamikaze pilots. Sometimes those planes were so old they could barely take off. Most of them missed. In the Philippines, only one out of every four kamikazes actually struck a target. No big ships were ever sunk by one. However, in Japan, all the newspapers made it sound as if their kamikaze missions were great successes. Soon, they said, the American fleet would be totally destroyed. What the Japanese newspapers said was far from the truth. Slowly but surely, the tide had been turned. As the first days of the new year of 1945 turned into weeks, and we sat there waiting on Pavavu, I began to believe that we were close to the end. The Japanese were continuing to retreat. Our planes were now bombing the enemy's homeland. It was clear that Japan was going to be defeated. Chief, my friend Smitty said, as he read Stars and Stripes, the armed forces newspaper given to servicemen. MacArthur has been kicking butt since he landed at Leet. Sounds like we're going to be celebrating the 4th of July in Tokyo this year. Y'all think that's something, Georgia boy said holding up the copy of his own paper. My work in teaching him to read had finally paid off a few months earlier. Now hardly a day went by without him wanting to read something aloud to us. Listen to this here. My New York Yankees have been sold to a snidey cat for $2,800,000. That there's about enough to buy the whole state of Georgia. I nodded to my friends. Each in his own way was excited about the prospect of the war's ending. But for what I now knew about the Japanese, I was very worried. When they decided it was hopeless, what would they do? Our war in the Pacific was so different from the one fought in Europe. In Europe, when our enemies saw they were losing a battle, they would often surrender. Sometimes tens of thousands of prisoners would be taken. I saw newsreels of long lines of defeated German soldiers just peacefully walking away from the battle, guarded by only a few Americans. They were abiding by the rules of war. How I wish that the Japanese would behave that way. Their rules, though, were different. You see, grandchildren, rules about modern warfare were made up between the nations of the world before World War II. Those rules said that prisoners of war, enemy soldiers who had surrendered or been captured, 
had to be fed and housed in a humane way. They had to be allowed visits by the Red Cross. Those rules, called the Geneva Convention, were agreed to in 1929 and signed by almost every major nation, but not the Japanese. They had different ideas about war. They had been taught since childhood that retreating, surrendering, or being captured in war was a great shame to your nation and family. A Japanese soldier was supposed to die in bonsai charges or kill himself rather than give up. Anyone, anyone taken captive by the Japanese was scorned as a coward. I learned after the war that as, as a result of that attitude, the Japanese prisoner of war camps were terrible places. Captured American and British and Australian soldiers were forced into slave labor, starved and beaten. Some were even used for medical experiments. Nearly half of the Allied soldiers who were captured by the Japanese during the war died in those camps. In the years since the war ended, I have met former Japanese soldiers. Some even came here to Dinatak and told me they were sorry for the things they did in the war. In Japan, one of the former soldiers told me, the army had two million men held in reserve along with thousands of kamikaze planes and suicide boats. 28 million people in our National Reserve Army, some just armed with sharp sticks. Imperial Command told us to prepare for the glorious death of 100 million to defend our sacred soil. Although they were eager to get to Japan, a lot of our military leaders also dreaded that thought. Millions of lives. Japanese and American, would be lost in a full-scale invasion. So our leaders were trying to defeat Japan in other ways. The first way was through blockades. There were so many people on the Japanese islands that they could not grow enough food to feed everyone. They had to import food as well as raw materials and fuel. Their leaders, their fears that they would not have enough to survive as a nation had led them to war so they would be able to control those things they needed. Now the war had cut them off from all their needs. By late 1944, their ships could no longer get into, get into or out of Japan without being attacked by our submarines. Our other plan was to bomb Japan's cities and factories. If their losses were great enough, perhaps the Japanese command would realize that they had to surrender. Our bombers were flying every day from Saipan and Guam to make raids on Tokyo. First, planes flew over, dropping millions of warning leaflets written in Japanese. We are going to bomb your city. Then, after the civilians had been given time to take shelter or leave, the bombers started their runs. My fear was that neither of those plans would work. Getting back to Pababu Island, I have to say there was one thing that took my mind off my fears, being with other Indians, including Navajo friends from back home who were ordinary jarheads and not code talkers. There were about 400 Navajo code talkers, but lots of other Navajos served. Usually because they were Indians, the Marines put them into scout companies. There were at least 100 other Navajo Marines in World War II. Several scout companies were on Pababu and all of them had Indians. On Pababu, I met Lakotas, Cheyennes, Cherokees, and Choctaws, even a Zuni. All of us being Indians, Indians in a white man's Marine Corps meant we had a lot in common. For one, every Indian had the same nickname. What do the guys in your unit call you? The answer was always the same. They call me Chief. Sam Little Fingernail, who was Cheyenne, was tired of it. We've got so many darn chiefs, he said, there's no room for any Indians. Sam had a way to respond to people who called him chief, as long as they weren't superior officers who could bust him for insubordination. When someone who didn't know Sam called him chief, he would answer, What, Mr. President? Most people got the point. I never did that, though. I knew that my own white friends who called me chief didn't mean to insult me, and I didn't want to hurt their feelings by correcting them. We Indians had plenty to share about the things we'd been through. Although we Navajos never told any Indian, who was not a code talker, anything about our secret. Near the end of our time on Pavavu, we all got together and had a sort of powwow. We Navajos did the Yai Bichai, our ceremonial dance that honors the holy people and brings them into our midst. 
the Oklahoma boys did some of their dancing too, and the Zuni guy sang a kind of honoring song for everyone. That was a good time, but I knew it couldn't last, and I was right. Soon after our powwow, our orders came to ship out. We were going to Iwo Jima. <laughs>